these prices are subject to change as the channel grows i'm dropping 25 episodes per month if you want a 10 episode lock-in where your promo is on 10 episodes that i drop three thousand dollars if you want your promo on five episodes fifteen hundred if you want to lock the whole 25 block down for the month get at me i give you a deal you could never refuse attention this is a new series it's called how i became a killer and we're gonna be diving into the history and psyche of some of the most notorious crime figures in history. And for those out there infatuated with the streets and infatuated with that criminal lifestyle, people say that there's rules to this street thing. But always remember, there are some criminals that don't play by the rules. And believe me, they're the most dangerous. So when I clicked on the cat, I said, yo, man, click. He's like, yo, you must be a know who I am. I don't give a damn who you are. You don't give it up. I'm a blush. So once again, the cat wanted to give me everything that he had on his neck, his wrist, you know what I'm saying right now, his fingers. Something I cheat off. Like, what was the first thing that you could remember seeing that was like disturbing growing up? Um, you see a lot of disturbing shit. You see people getting high. Now, I grew up in the Bethel Stops section on Horsey between Patch and Route. And when you grow up and you like, you know, five, six years old, and you seeing adults, male and female, like they not, they strung out. You don't even know what it is. You're a kid. You seeing people laying on the concrete, like on the stoop, out cold. You you can't comprehend it because you're too young to comprehend. Not knowing that they're actually not out from the shot. You know, saying they shot some hair on up in their arm or they snipped or whatever. So. That was more or less like some of the first like stuff that you see that was kind of off the wall. And then I can remember one incident in particular and being a kid on a block and you watch it like this guy, you know what I'm saying? He's saying the girl was his wife and he beating the living daylight out of her. So when you sit back and think about it, I'm saying if I'm five, six years old, we talking about this have to be like 69, 1970. So even with that being said, you're watching them beating the blood out of this woman. And you see cops pull up, get out the car, you know, trying to break it up. And a guy tell them, get the F out of here, man. This is my wife. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute here. And to me, that sucker was kind of legal up until 1994 when the OJ Simpson came along and all that stuff ceased. So it's different things that you see from a violent standpoint. And then right now is we talk about the gangs in New York. When I was coming up as kids, you know what? The gangs went away. You had the Tomahawk. You had the Hellcats. You had the Sex Boys. But eventually, right now, like the mid-70s, that gang stuff kind of disappeared. I was living best side, you know, from all my life, like from the beginning until we moved out of Best Dive in 1975, and that's when we moved to East New York, Cypress Hill Project. And when you moved to Cypress, it was worse than Best Dive or better? Nah, man. <laughs> Best Dive, sit back and think about it. Last, you got, like, where I come from, we live in an apartment building like a brownstone. And right now, you know, it was six families two family on each floor. The building only go up to the third floor. So you had a total of six families in one building. But despite the brownstone was connected to each other, some brownstone, you probably have somebody was fortunate to have a one family in that brownstone. Some brownstone have more, like you say, eight families. 
Some Browns don't have two, three families. So I left there and we went to the project where in one building, you got seven floors, seven apartments, 49 different families in one building. The Cypress probably had like what, 40 something building at that? So you look at it like, man, you went from to me, I thought we went from the suburb, the suburb to the damn ghetto, man. And how old was you said when y'all moved in? 75, I said right now is um 12. And when like you months. when you moved there, was you already like, was you already what was cons- what would be considered a bad kid, or was you still yeah, a good I, kid? You know what? I was still a decent kid. You know, um, because even with seventy five, when I moved to Cyprus, you know, I moved in the back of Cyprus, four fifty five Fountain Avenue side, and who happened to be who who I happened to live in the same building with, Walter King Tut Johnson, like me Tut. Like, you know, I lived in, my family moved to the sixth floor and Tut and his family lived on the second floor. The crazy part about that is, you know, you move in, you're a new kid. Man, look, people don't understand about new. It's good to have a new pair of sneakers, a new pair of pants, a new coat. You know what, you know, a new car, a new house. But what's not good to be, being a new kid in a new area. You know, being at a, you know, being new at school. That's not really all that because once again you got problems. So even being a new kid into the project, me and Tucky Sita, he ain't saying up for me, I ain't saying up for him. And one day in particular, we was going to PS two fourteen. And I can remember back then, you know, we both in the sixth grade. As I was coming down to go into the auditorium, he was coming out to get on the bus. You know what I'm saying? To go home. So right now as I'm walking past him, I got a bunch of books in my hand. This cat shoulder checked me. Boom! Drop my books. So when I drop my books, the normal kids gonna go ahead and just pick up their books as an accident. Nah, when he shoulder checked me, I ran after him and put him in a country headlock and start pounding on his face until they, they broke it up, put us both in the um, auditorium and basically right now, that's how me and him became friends. How old was you when you basically started venturing off into the streets and crime about 13 14 man it's like you know basically probably about you know eighth eighth grade you know got to crime and the first act of crime was selling fake jewelry burglarizing before you graduate and get into you know robbing sticking up we stick people with guns stick people out with guns stick people up with fake guns I can remember the time the game used to be you get on the train. We in East New York, you go into Manhattan. You get the A train to the F train. I can remember sitting by a gentleman. You know what? Listen, mister, don't make a move. My man next to me got a gun. You know, give it up. He just came home from Rikers Island. He's crazy. I got my buddy sitting next to him on the other side, giving a crazy look like he's, you know, like he's on something, like he's psycho or whatever. You know, here it is right now. Guess what? People give it up. Sometimes you get away with a couple hundred, a couple thousand. Sometimes you get away with nothing. Mm. And in your crib at this time, like where you lived at, like y'all was, y'all was struggling for money. Like what was going on in the crib that you felt you had to start doing crimes and stuff? Sit back and think about it. That, uh, that's an interesting point. And I mean, to me, we never like were struggling for money because my mom's. She worked at New York Telephone Company. My step pop worked for Transit. So some of the things that right now is we had. Like I never went to bed hungry. I never, we was the type of family that, guess what? You gotta pour roaches out of your cereal and you gotta pour sour milk on it just to get something in your belly. It was never like that. But what it is, it's like when you watch some of your friends in the neighborhood able to get summer jobs. And you apply for a summer job and they deny you saying that your mom's making too much. We live in a project. And see, that's the funny part about it. Living in a project was a choice. My mother and pop, my mom's, my pop wanted to go to Queens. You know, because both of their salary, they can afford it. But my mother wanted to go to Cyprus. And people look at, why would your mother want to go to Cyprus? 
because my mom came from a close knitted family. And right now was, she was close with her sisters. She had two sisters, one living on the South Net, one living on Linda Boulevard side, and one living on the um, South Avenue side of the Friday. And we landed on the Fountain side and eventually moved to the Sutter side. So she went there from the from, from pure fact to be around family. She wanted to be closer to her sisters. It was at the time when y'all was doing stuff like robbing people on the train and mess and robbing people with fake guns. Who was you messing with at that time? You know what? Um, my man Tut, my man um, may so rest in peace. You know, Boo Brown, uh, Rick Martin, um, Domino. But Domino was one of those smooth crim. Domino, you didn't get caught up into that stuff, man. He did his little dirt. But he was born like Michael Jackson say, smooth criminal, man. A lot of knucklehead stuff. He was like advanced, man. Nah, man, that's not for me. So basically like the little hoopums from around the neighborhood, man. So what was that turning point though when, you know, when, when, when things started really getting violent? You know, when things start getting violent, man, when you start getting older and people do not understand what don't make you break you. Like to me, like I try to tell people the time the first few times I went through like an alley, you got beat up, you got robbed, got my stuff taken. I remember being from Brooklyn. So you from Brooklyn, but you got a case in Queens. So you in the Queens bullpen. So you you come in and go to court and you got your little leather British walkers on, your leather coat on or whatever, and you being welcomed by, you get remanded, you be welcomed by the Queens committee. So you know, most of these cats there, you know, they done been in there for a year and a half, two years, whatever, going upstate. These look like professional bodybuilders. So the difference is they done put a couple of lumps in your head, take your stuff or whatever. They took your, you know, I got, first I got robbed, I got my first walk ticket. And I can remember this cat, Beanie from Corona, gave me a pair of Adidas, you know what I'm saying? Pair for the boomers. You get your leather jacket taken. You know, this is right now coming through Queens, Queens bullpen to get to Rikers Island, 1980. You said you came through with a pair of British walkers? British walkers, man. 1980, man. 16 years old. Came through. You know, I got remanded in the court. Came through with some British walkers on. A black British walker and a black leather coat. You know, right now, by the time I left that bullpen or whatever from scuffing with these cats, I was left with a white and red pair, shell toe Adidas, and a, a goose down vest. Beanie was like the, uh, a baby, like, let me see, I'm, I'm trying, a baby Arnold Schwarzenegger, man, you know, and we fought in the bull pitch, and right now, guess what, he won, and, then, and I'm saying right now, and then it was do Mel, they was both there, like, you know, you, the difference right now, when you're in Queens, you're in a bull pit or whatever, you know, you gotta keep your mouth shut, you get jumped or whatever, bingo, you, you, you go with the punches, man. And they was both Queens kids? Yeah, one, the, the crazy part, both was Queens, but one was Queens, Brooklyn, because the crazy part about it, as yet went on, man, you know, uh, from years later when I became Blaze, Eminem, you know, I ran back into um, the Dumel, you know what I'm saying, Simon, on Picking Avenue, and I'm already, look, bro, I'm already Eminem, and I can remember being in Simon, him and his brother there, but you know what, bro, like I say, people don't understand, man, what don't make you, you know what I'm saying, what don't break you, make you. So to me, he ran, they all ass. Like, but by that time, listen, man, that's part of the game. To me, I went from at one point in time, you know, got beat up and robbed on Rikers Island to a few years later, guess what? We don't want him on Rikers Island, he's a menace. So after that happened with the, with the British walkers and all of that, that's when you went to Rikers Island? Yeah, that's when I went to Rikers Island. What happened, in the, it happened in the bullpen from Queens Court on your way to Rikers Island. And and, and, you have, and that time you went to the four building? Yes, he said he four, yeah. And that was still 1980, you said, right? 1980, mm-hmm. Every, two laws I took was in 1980. How was it, how was it on Rikers Island in 1980? Like, what, what type of stuff was going on in that four building? Hey man, everything was going on in the four building. You had a lot of stabbing, a lot of piping. Um, you have people getting raped. You see a lot of different things on there, man. And you gotta sit back and think more. People understand about Rikers Island, C-74. It's detonated for, what, 16 to 20. So right now is, I got in the fight one cat. I know goddamn well G was not, you know what I'm saying, right now is 20, 
know what I'm saying? I know this guy probably like 25, 30. So when you sit back and you think like you're trying to fight him or whatever, guess what could happen? It's like this guy right now look like, you know, hey, look, Hulk Hogan. So even right now, when you're going at it with him or whatever, what wins do you have? You still fight because you still got to fight. You know, one thing about it, if you don't do shit, you know, you will get totally taken advantage of. The fact that you're at least trying to fight or whatever, I'm hitting this cat, it's like a mosquito bite. When he hit me, it feel like one of those Tom and Jerry, like somebody just hit you with a frying pan. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. How long you had to lay up on Rikers Island at that time? Bro, I was in and out, man. Like, Rikers Island was like my second home, man, in and out. And so right now, you lay up 30 days, get bailed out or whatever, go home. Got stabbed while I was on Rikers Island. You know, a few things. On that, trip, went, on that trip or on another trip? On another trip. Like I said right now, wait, wait, like right now, I got stabbed on my last trip before I had to come back and do a bid. And, and you know, right now, after, be, or after being on an island for like about 45 days or whatever, you know, I got stabbed in my arm over the phone. See, and that's like, you got a little crew. My man, Big Head Mike and Skill from Brownsville, that got a little crew. And then, you know, right now, guess what? You know, you house in the phone. That got pre predominant house in the phone. And I got stabbed by them. I, I can't even think of the cat name. But right now, where's Spanish cat that, um, they was from the Bronx, you know? So the different woods, like, right, you know, when I got stabbed, you know, coming back from, we was coming back from somewhere. And I got shanked in my arm or whatever. I still got the dick. That's the only mark I got from Michael Zowen, man. As far as the stab wounds. But once again, I got a technical shot and the little crew that I had beat, beat the cat down or whatever. You know, but it went from the next time I came in there, you already had it in your head. You know you're not going home. You know you ain't getting no bail. You know you got to go to state. So it was like automatic in your mind. I'm not accepting any type of form of disrespect. And I remember doing that period of time, July 81, you know, um, shit, I forgot, what was it, what, what was the new job, I think right now, hold up, I'm trying to think, you had the one building, the three building, and the five building, I think, what building was like for new Jack? I think it was what, three lower, I can't even remember, man, it's been so long, it was three lower, or three upper, back then, but anyway, we was going to the housing area, and, you know, we, you know, with the house, you know how the, um, CEO was telling you, South side, south side, south side, north side, north side. I don't want no commotion. I don't want nothing. But as I was walking from the mess hall to back to the um uh, to the cell to the cell block, you know, hit is this cat. He must be new, nervous. He stepped on the back of my foot, and I'm like looking, and like I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And as I keep walking, he stepped on my other side. I'm like, and he say sorry, guys. Yeah. I'm like, I'm gonna get this cat, man. And right now, as soon as he'll say south side, south side, north side, north side, side, and they went downstairs to let everybody in, I just turned around and sucker punched this cat, boom, boom, and slammed his head into the wall. From that point on, right now, with when they came, they see him, you know, right there on the ground, they came and rushed me or whatever, you know how they do, whip your ass or whatever, and send you about your merry way. I didn't even get no bean time for that. But from that point on, it was like, I'm not taking no short, because once again, you got to set the rules and regulation. And you know, from that point on, I never took a loss on Rikers Island. I came from, as time went on, when I went upstate, you built your little reputation up, um, you get into a problem, you handle it. I caught 150 days in fish kill, like 150 days, six months plus a good time, and a brand new court case for a stabbing beef. Um, back in fish kill in 83, I got kicked out of fish kill and went to Green Haven. And from that point on, you got a little reputation. Wow, what happened in Fishkill though? In Fishkill, it, it, it was it was a racial riot, man. Um, it was a racial riot with my man Tiny. Tiny was a Tiny wasn't even a, Tiny wasn't really even involved in it. Tiny was a sticker kid from uh, Beth and Stuyvesant. May so rest in peace, Marcellus Lawrence. And my man Tank, me and Tank was in K Unit at the time, and Tank got into a beef with this cat named Panama, Little Panama. So long story short, you gotta remember, it's the summer, 1983 in July, you know, and every so often, you know, blacks, Hispanic, we get in the beef. So just so happened, at this particular time, the game plan was everybody coming to the yard. And right now is, guess what? We gonna go at it, we going to war. So you go to the yard, everybody go to the yard, supposed to bring their little shank, their little hammer, their little, uh, 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 you know, but metal in the socks, whatever. I go to the yard, it's July. You know, I got on a damn 
winter coat, that green coat. But just so happens, man, the green coat that I inherit is right now, it's like you had the holes already in it. So what you're putting in, in your coat, you're putting books in it. You're putting books around in your coat as far as what lay in for protection in case somebody trying to stab you. So I got on this hot coat in the winter time with books all around it. I got a hammer. I got a screwdriver. I got a shank. I got a weight in the socks. So once again, everybody say, look, they don't care. We going to war. All of a sudden right now is when all the people in the 21, we in 21 a yard, all of a sudden, all the CEOs with their helmet and the riot gear start coming out. Everybody starts throwing their damn shank away. And I'm like, fucking hell, I'm looking at Tiny and all this stuff. Yo, what the hell y'all doing? I think we going. But at the end, some of the main characters, like Big Panama, this cat named Big and Flacco, they like, yo, man, Blaze was with it. He was down with it. Because they started sending all these other guys that they felt was the big instigator for the ride. They started, they locked my man Tiny up. They locked my man Tank up. So in the process of that, probably like a few days after the supposed to be riot on uh, Panama and Vic and Flacco try to stab me. I was coming from 21 A yard going back to building 21. And they try to stab me in between. So even with that, they try to get me, I escaped. I caught Big Panama on the um, 21A mess hall early one morning and stabbed the shit out of him in the mess hall because he used to work in the box. And I went to the hole and I caught 150 days, lost a good time in a brand new court case. So at this time, how old do you when all of this is going on? Back then, 20. So it was 19 going on 20. Because right now, this was in July 83. I didn't turn 20 until December 83. So right now, you know, you got the 150 days in a hole, the brand new court case or whatever, and I got kicked out from Fishville, and they sent me to Greenhaven Max A joint, Stoneville, New York. Now, on this bid right here that you're doing, before you went to jail on this bid, was you already running around with guns and stuff like that in the streets, yeah, shooting and me, stuff like that? Yeah, me and Tut back then, like I said right now, was, you know, me, Tut, me, Rick Martin, all of us, like I said, we had a little, you know what I'm saying, 22, 25, yeah, we had a little guns then. And right now was I had some shooting beef, you know what I'm saying, but nothing as far as a body or anything like that. When you came home from that bed, how old how old was you when you went right back to Cyprus? Yeah, when I came home from that bed, man, I can remember, bro, like I said right now, when I got out, it was like right now, like um, I went away in July 81, just before I went away. Just before I went away, I had stuck with this cat. He was like flaunting around like Cyprus with a bunch of jewelry on. His name was Panama, and he's an older cat. I didn't know who he was. So I'm looking at this cat, free lunch. You know, I'm looking at him. I'm going to Lancet Street. I'm going to buy me some new British Walkers, new Playboys, new Pumas, Adidas, you know what I'm saying? Gabardine, Marfneck, whatever. Tangos, BBD, Paris. You know, you look at everything you're gonna buy. I'm counting the chicken before it hats. So when I click on the cat, I say, yo, man, click. He's like, yo, Bill McClive, man, you must be on know who I am. I don't give a damn who you are. You don't give it up. I'm a blush. So once again, the cat wanna give me everything that he had on his neck, his wrist, you know what I'm saying right now, with his fingers. So I'm thinking I G'd off. Man, I took that stuff upstairs. Cause like I told you, I started out selling fake jewelry. I took that stuff upstairs, thinking I'm gonna take it to 4750 Street. When I examined it, that stuff was fake. So I'm saying right now, you about to get blast. Are oh, you only thing you have to tell your bro, listen, man, you waste your time. This is fake. I'm fighting for the girls. Now, he didn't tell me that. So right now, when I, 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 you know, like I told you right now, is when I went in, did three and a half years, came home. By that time, they had the A team, and he was part of the A team. And right now, I didn't know until after the fact, till I became cool with the 18, that when I came home, I was already on a hit list based upon because I robbed them and they knew I was wild from upstate, like they was going to get me because they felt I was a threat. You said all his jewelry was fake? <laughs> man, bro, listen, man. Every last bit of it was fake, man. <laughs> Every last bit of it, man. This dude had on, he had like a, a, a Mr. T starter kit and every piece was fake. So I would have got, like I said, I would have blasted him for some fake jewelry and I almost got killed when I came home. 
because I robbed a nigga for a bunch of fake jewelry. If that happened, I robbed this guy. I got knocked in July 31st, 1981. So that happened probably like a week before I got knocked. And when I came home in November of 84, the A team was already established. And when I came home, you know, it was like a section of the cypress that if you didn't live on that section, which is the A team side, if you didn't live on that section, you couldn't walk past there. You couldn't walk there. You couldn't go through there. So I can remember people that, like I say, my brother, our family members, our friends, like nobody would go through there. So it just got to the point that I just got so frustrated about that, that I used to take me a jammy and go through there, hoping somebody would say, yo, you can't walk on this side, so you can blast them in their face. But every time I walked through there, nothing ever happened. But once again, as time went on, I want to, you know, um, that, you know what I'm saying? I want to, I, well, I used to go look out. I had this habit, especially when I was making money. Like, you know how you know people that you grew up with, you know, and then people that you met in jail. So I had a habit of making sure that I look out for people. So I used to visit people on Rikers Island and all of state. And if we build a barn, I used to take care of a lot of people in jail. So just so happened, one of the guys was my co-defendant since we was kid. He caught a body in 1981. And he caught a body, um, he caught a murder, 1981, October. I was already on Rikers Island when he caught the body. I caught my case in July. Had I not caught that on Robbie Beef, chances are I would have been right there with him. So this will happen right now is I'm there. So when, when I got out from doing my bed, he had 25 life. So I used to do everything possible I can do for him and his family. Because once again, you know what, this is my man. I remember every can good, every soap or cosmetic had a bunch of stuff that when I came home from the state bit, I went to the county jail, but all that stuff I brought home with me for one reason, because I took that stuff and mailed it back to him. He was in um, Clinton at the time. So I can remember, December, or like I think it was December 27th, the Renato Snipe and um, Larry Holmes fight. It was on ABC. And I can remember he came calling me. And like, yo, so I got all this information. And the very next day, I went to the post office, mailed him off his package. And then like right now, sent him like what I had in my pocket, uh, a money order. And I can remember my late mother telling me, look, there's nothing wrong with looking out for somebody. You know what I'm saying? That's a great thing to do. But you gotta sit back and think about it. You just getting home now. So you gotta get yourself established. The one thing about him, he got food to eat. He got somewhere to live. And right now he got clothes on his back. So you gotta get yourself established. And I never forget that. But the difference is right now where it's like, cause she taught us the best to give and receive. So my thing is this, my man, his situation is different. His family wasn't as, like how can I say, together as mine was, and he was like family. I did everything I could possibly do when I was out. Even when I caught a body and I was making money, I was still paying people to go see him to make sure that he was all right or whatever. But when one time I went to see him, he the one told me, listen, man, about the A team. He said, look, man, what you need to do, you need to go see one of the main guys. He said, look, I grew up with him, you know, such and such, such, such. Just pull him aside one day, you got to just have a heart-to-heart -heart talk. And I remember leaving from Auburn one day, and I went on Blake and Logan, you know, a few blocks away from Cypress. And I saw one of the main guys, and there's a bunch of them out there. And I asked him, yo, can I have a minute of your time? So he came, we talked. I said, look, man, I don't know you, you don't know me. I'm saying right now, where's Okay, look, long as you, whatever you got to do is none of my business. Long as you don't do nothing to me, my family, our people I love and care about it, we don't have no problem. So basically right now where it's like, that's when we built the bond. Because once again, he like, I left. And then right now, a few days later, he came back around me. He said, yo, man, you got a lot of balls. He said, you coming around me by your damn self, no guns, no nothing. And you telling me what you like, what you don't like. He said, look, man, I'm going to call you Bugsy at the Bugsy signal. He said, because you crazy, man. And long story short, he wanted to put me part of his security team. 
And he broke it down. He said, yo, when you came home, we were going to kill you because you brought the Panama. And the only reason they didn't kill me or try to kill me was the fact that Panama had did something foul to one of the family members of theirs that he disappeared. So basically, that's how I escaped, escaped that death trap and became down with them. Yeah, mm-hmm. this, this was, I came home in 84. This happened in 85. This happened like the summer 85. I was never a member of the A-team. Initially, he wanted to be a part. He wanted to be a, a full member of the A-team. But the A-team was consists of majority of five percenters. And they voted. And right now, when they vote, like, nah, he's not, you know. And like I said right now, it was no skin off my back. So he made me head of security. How old was you the first time you had to actually shoot somebody? Um, the first time I shot somebody, I think I was 16. And we was in Cyprus. And, you know, um, being a cat, he, you know, like had like a little disagreement or whatever. And right now it's like, I, 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 I don't know. I think I, I, I was saying like this, man, I feel like shooting somebody. And I can recall everybody being there. We was like over there in a section of by Cyprus parking lot in the park. And I can remember a few girls being there and a few guys. And everybody like right now, so I feel like she was like, they're like, well, I'm not gonna tell. I'm not gonna tell. I'm not gonna tell. So one of the guys said, I'm not gonna tell. I said, well, you the one I wanna shoot. You know what I'm saying, period. So basically right now, he said something slick and I popped him. So that's the first time right now where it's like from that standpoint. And that was like 80, 81. And where he got shot at? In the leg. Yeah, that's the first time. And after that, how you felt? Um, literally, I didn't feel nothing. When we when I shot him, um, I think it was like a hollow point bullet. Because right now where's the reaction? It's like the way like you like it, 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 it last. That's what we want people to understand, like the mentality back then. It is, I shot. And right now is like the way he, his reaction and what he did. And he, he, everybody that was there, same was like five people that was there. And the way his reaction was, is everybody there, including myself, you know what we did? We laughed. And that's, this, that's what I'm showing you right now. Somebody just got shot. And our mindset was because he did some type of reaction that caused everybody to laugh. So to me, when you sit back and think about it, like, damn, you know, we, we, we all sick back then? And it was a situation I'm saying to myself, oh shit, because once he stopped laughing, we all like, like, but once he stopped, like, you know, everybody stopped laughing, and he whole ass, he took off. And I'm like, oh shit, I'm going to jail. I went out there to finish it off. But by that time, too many people fell and the crowd came around with too many people. But he never told. These prices are subject to change as the channel grows. I'm dropping 25 episodes per month. If you want a 10 episode lock in where your promo is on 10 episodes that I drop, $3,000. If you want your promo on five episodes, $1,500. If you want to lock the whole 25 block down for the month, get at me. I give you a deal you could never refuse. Z-Man Suicide Polo with the Ski Man. Sponsors, get at me.